What is truth? And what does it mean to say that something is true? These are philosophical questions that have had a very long history of speculation and debate. But from an evolutionary, population based perspective, the nature of truth can be seen to have a biological basis. And from this perspective, new insights can be gained into these time old questions. Both in terms of the fundamental nature of truth, and also the way in which individuals within a population recognize and understand it. So let's examine truth from a biological, population based perspective. Or more specifically, from the new theoretical perspective that was outlined in the previous videos of this series. A brief summary of this new perspective concerning the relationship between brain biology and culture is as follows. The human brain can be categorized into seven major types of brain activity, each of which manifests as a key aspect of human culture. First we have the areas of the brain responsible for sensory awareness. This category of brain activity includes all the neurochemical processes associated with the senses. Sensations of sight, sound, smell, touch and taste. And these collectively manifest as the cultural arts. From the visual arts, to music, and the culinary arts. Next we have the areas of the brain associated with rationality. These include spatial recognition, short and long-term memory logical induction and deduction, and importantly, pattern recognition. All of which, allow humans to locate and exploit, environmental resources, in an ongoing manner. As such, this brain activity manifests as the mode of production, of all human populations. A manifestation, that is composed of our technology and science, and the logical practices and procedures, that organize us in a rational manner. But for humans to survive, they also need the brain areas associated with social intelligence in order to function and reproduce effectively in social groups. This collection of cognitive processes includes the ability to recognize the emotional states and motivations of others and to recognize and respond to group hierarchy through an ability to interact with specific individuals in an appropriate way. Social intelligence initially manifests as gossip but it eventually takes the form of all types of human storytelling. From individual performance storytelling, to theater, puppetry, film and television. Next we have the neurochemical processes associated with self-awareness. These include an awareness of self-survival and sensations of individuality and personal well-being. Self-awareness manifests as business enterprise. At the opposite extreme to self-awareness, we have the areas of the brain associated with what can be called other awareness. These neurochemical processes include sensations of altruism and caregiving, and a general awareness of the health and condition of others. Not surprisingly then, these brain processes manifest as all the nurturing and welfare practices and institutions of human populations. From child care, to schools to healthcare centers, and hospitals. Next we have areas of the human brain associated with what can be referred to as dominance. From an individual point of view, these neurochemical processes trigger behaviors such as aggression and dominance. However, from a population perspective, dominance is really about the desire to control the social and physical environment. And, as such, Dominance manifests as all the warfare and policing practices and institutions of human culture. And finally, we have the metaphysics area of the human brain, which is composed of neurochemical processes, which ironically, are a consequence of rational brain processes. Once humans evolved rationality, they would also have acquired a cognitive awareness of non-rationality. And in order to deal with the individual and collective anxiety, this awareness of non-rational events created. Metaphysics neurochemical processes manifested as the belief systems of a population with associated rituals and institutions. So how then did these seven key areas of human brain activity actually manifest as the key areas of culture?
a process, which can be referred to as, neurochemical emergence. This occurred, due to the creation of what can be called, items of mediation, which are all the objects, sounds, and ideas, created by humans, to stimulate the corresponding areas of their brains. Let's look at some examples of these items of mediation, for each of the key neurochemical processes. In the case of sensory awareness, we see the creation of human-made objects, sounds, smells, and tastes, such as all the items of visual art, music, and food dishes, that stimulate the sensory areas of the brain. These fundamental neurochemical processes of sensory awareness, therefore collectively constitute the cultural arts. In regard to rationality, we have a long history of the creation of items of mediation that stimulate this area of the brain, which collectively manifest as all of our technology, with the social intelligence neurochemical processes. These manifest as all forms of storytelling, including the basic storytelling of gossip, the individual storytelling of performance, and the modern forms of storytelling, such as theater and film. Next we have, self-awareness, which emerges from the human brain, as the simple exchange of goods and services, between individuals, which initially formed the basis of local trade, and eventually, manifested as the international trade, of the modern period. In the case of other awareness, Examples of early items of mediation would be medicinal plants and simple medical apparatuses, such as crutches. Then we saw the development of pharmaceutics and numerous specific instruments. And eventually, other awareness manifested as the large-scale items of mediation of modern medical equipment. The items of mediation associated with dominance have taken two forms. Firstly, those associated with warfare. And secondly, those associated with policing. Both of which are used to control and secure the social and physical environments of human populations. And in the case of metaphysics, we see its emergence as a large number of items of mediation in the form of both objects and sounds, such as religious icons and the special sounds made by an array of religious instruments, and also as rituals, which collectively stimulate the metaphysics neurochemical processes of groups of individuals. However, more needs to be said about the neurochemical processes of individuals within populations. While every human uses all of the key neurochemical processes of their brain on a daily basis, each human Nevertheless, has a preference to use one type of brain process more than the others. For some people, it's a preference for stimulating their rationality. For others, it's their other awareness. And still others, it's their sensory awareness. And so on. And individuals with a common neurochemical preference naturally group together. And they use specific items of mediation to stimulate the preferred area of their brain in an ongoing manner, such as the specific collections of objects, sounds, and rituals already mentioned. And so we see the emergence of the key groups of culture. Caregivers, entrepreneurs, soldiers, worshippers, artists, builders, and storytellers. And it's these groups of like-minded individuals that manifest all of the seven key areas of human culture through the use, or creation, of literally billions of items of mediation. All of which, collectively constitute the culture of human beings. In this sense then, culture is simply the manifestation, of the neurochemical processes of the human brains, of a population. As items of mediation. A process of cultural formation, that can be referred to as neurochemical emergence. Which is the key characteristic, of the human species. So from a population perspective then, we have this diversity of human brain types. 
but there's one other important aspect of human brains that we need to consider here. In order to understand not only human culture, but also within the current context, the question of what truth actually is. And that aspect of human brains is the type of thinking that individuals engage in, based on the degree to which they generalize about their surroundings and the world. This type of thinking can be categorized into three broad groups. Practical thinkers, analytical thinkers, and abstract thinkers. Practical thinkers are individuals who don't generalize to any large degree. They're mainly concerned with solving practical problems in real time. And they act on the material world and the people around them in a direct and constant ongoing manner. These people are the most important people in any population as they provide the functions, skills, and practices that maintain and grow any and every human culture. Examples of these types of thinkers are practitioners of the arts, such as painters, musicians, and cooks, all types of blue and white collar workers, traders and salespersons, caregivers, soldiers and police officers, and worshippers of all belief systems. The second type of thinker can be referred to as analytical. These individuals think in a more general way than the practical thinkers, which allows them to have a larger overview of their immediate surroundings and conditions, and allows them to organize practical thinkers to create larger objects, structures, social tasks, and functions. Examples of these individuals are engineers and architects, film directors. Business managers, senior nurses, and all types of teachers, senior military and police officers, and priests. Finally, we have individuals who are abstract thinkers. These people think in a very general way about society, the world, and the universe, both in regard to space and time. Examples of these people are scientists, philosophers, writers prophets, and theorists of all forms. So we can represent any human population in the following way. We have individuals with a brain type that has a preference to stimulate one of the key neurochemical processes. And each individual also has a particular type of thinking which roughly falls within one of the three categories. And these cognitive characteristics of any human population manifest as particular occupations. In the case of contemporary industrialized societies, we see practical, sensory awareness, manifesting as art practitioners, such as painters, sculptors, musicians, and cooks. Analytical, sensory awareness, manifests as art curators, and art, music, and culinary teachers. Abstract, sensory awareness, manifests as art, music, and culinary theorists, and reviewers. In the case of rationality, we have practical rationality, manifesting as all the blue and white collar workers. Analytical rationality, as engineers, applied scientists, and science teachers. And abstract rationality, manifesting as theoretical physicists. And so on, for the other key areas of the brain. I'll just give you a moment to look at the occupations that manifest from them. So what then, does all this have to do, with the question of truth? Well the suggestion here, is that it's the specific biology of the brain of each individual, which determines their sensation of truth. That truth, for an individual, is simply the cognitive pleasure, that comes from stimulating, the specific neurochemical processes of their brain. And the way individuals stimulate their specific neurochemical processes, is through the use of items of mediation. So for example, when any individual in a population wants to stimulate their visual sensory awareness in an ongoing manner, they buy a particular painting, an item of mediation, to do this. The item they buy is usually the result of the type of thinker they are. If they're a practical thinker, the painting will be representational in form. If they're an abstract thinker, the painting will usually be abstract or non-representational. 
and if they're an analytical thinker. The painting will be somewhere in between. This is a generalization of course. Other factors influence this type of choice. But this is usually what results. Statistically speaking, across a population. From the desire of individuals to stimulate their visual sensory awareness. And in regard to truth. In this specific case, of the truth of visual sensory awareness. Each individual experiences the sensation of truth. Every time they look at the painting, they have broad. Because it's a particular item of mediation that accurately stimulates their unique neurochemical processes of visual sensory awareness. In this sense, then, truth is a biological process. It's a simple process that gives an individual cognitive and emotional pleasure. The same situation applies for the other types of sensory awareness. In the case of auditory awareness, the genres of music represent items of mediation that different types of thinkers use to stimulate their auditory awareness. From popular music for practical thinkers, to classical music for abstract thinkers, and somewhere in between for analytical thinkers. And when a specific type of music accurately stimulates the auditory awareness of an individual, they experience truth, the truth of auditory sensory awareness. And likewise, this is the same for our sense of taste. Yes, you can actually taste truth. It's that special meal you look forward to that accurately stimulates the neurochemical processes associated with your particular taste awareness. It's that sensation of pleasure which is intricately tied to your unique brain biology of taste. And it's another part of your particular truth of sensory awareness in general. And as we will see, this same basic situation applies to all the key neurochemical processes of the human brain for all members of a population. In the case of individuals with a preference for rationality, who are practical thinkers, they stimulate their brains by using items of mediation, such as implements and tools, on an ongoing basis. The tools and materials they use to build and maintain objects are the items of mediation that stimulate the rationality of their brain and gives them a sensation of rational truth. Every time, when these individuals are building or maintaining something, that things fit together or come together in a correct logical way, they get a pleasurable sensation in their brain. This is their rational truth. Likewise, analytical rational individuals use their own specific items of mediation such as diagrams and applied mathematics, to stimulate and manifest their personal rational truth. These type of individuals, such as engineers, get rational cognitive pleasure by designing small and large-scale technology and organizing practical rational individuals to build it. And every time they solve an engineering problem or successfully organize a construction project, they have accurately stimulated the rational neurochemical processes of their brain. And at these moments, they feel the cognitive sensation of rational truth. And in the case of abstract rational individuals, the items of mediation they use to stimulate and manifest their rational neurochemical processes are the components of theoretical mathematical physics. The beauty and functionality of their equations gives them a pleasurable sensation of truth, which echoes the specific neurochemical rationality of their brain. So that's but another type of truth that the human mind experiences. But as mentioned, this basic procedure can be seen to apply to all the key neurochemical processes, each of which creates its own sensation of truth. Let's look at social intelligence now, which is a composite of neurochemical processes that allow humans to live and procreate in groups. This includes the ability to recognize the emotional states and motivations of others. To be able to recognize deception in others and to deceive others. And to recognize and respond to group hierarchy through an ability to interact with specific individuals in an appropriate way. All of which manifest as human storytelling. All humans possess these cognitive abilities. But the way in which they are stimulated and manifested across a population once again, depends on the type of thinking of an individual. 
Practical thinkers stimulate these neurochemical processes through the use of language in the form of gossip. This basic form of storytelling is an important component of culture and is engaged in, to various degrees, by all members of a population. For practical thinkers, gossip creates a sensation of truth if it accurately stimulates the social intelligence processes of their brain. A story about another individual has to satisfy the basic components of social intelligence. The motivations of the person in the story have to be plausible. Their relationships with other people in the story have to make sense. And any deception that is claimed in the story must appear realistic. And so on. When these basic criteria of a story about another individual are met, the listener feels a sensation of cognitive pleasure. And this sensation is the truth of their social intelligence. And in regard to analytical thinkers, these individuals manifest their social intelligence in the form of theatrical performances and the creation of films. By directing theater and film productions, they experience a sensation of pleasure if a production, at the very least, accurately stimulates the social intelligence of the audience. This then is their truth of social intelligence. In the case of the social intelligence of abstract thinkers, they stimulate and manifest their social intelligence through the use of written language. This item of mediation allows them to tell fictional stories that can transgress both space and time. As in the case of novels or screenplays that describe the happenings of a whole community or nation. Or historical novels that describe the events of an individual, family, community, or nation from the past. And once again, if the written story accurately stimulates the basic components of social intelligence, the writer feels a sensation of truth. As does any individual in the population who reads the story. This same basic approach can be applied to the four other key neurochemical processes of the human brain. In the case of self-awareness, which is a collection of neurochemical processes that include self-survival, sensations of individuality, and personal pleasure and well-being. We see that for practical thinkers, these cognitive processes are stimulated by the exchange of goods and services. And every time a practical thinker buys an item or receives a service that stimulates accurately their unique neurochemical processes of self-awareness, they not only feel the pleasure of the exchange and the use of the item, they also experience their particular truth of self-awareness. This is the case for all individuals across a population. But for those individuals who have a strong preference for self-awareness, and have an analytical mind. They have the added stimulation of their self-awareness through their entrepreneurial enterprises. These individuals organize practical thinkers in order to create the goods and services that everyone enjoys. And in the process, if they successfully do this, they stimulate their unique self-awareness neurochemical processes in an ongoing manner and consequently experience their unique truth of self-awareness. For the small percentage of individuals within a population that have a strong preference for self-awareness and are abstract thinkers, they stimulate their brains through the theorizing of systems of exchange. These economic theorists or economists gain added self-awareness stimulation through the abstract understanding of how economic systems are formed and function. And when they experience an accurate stimulation of their neurochemical processes in this regard, they too feel their unique cognitive truth of self-awareness. Next, we come to the situation of other awareness, which is a composite of neurochemical processes that include sensations of altruism, nurturing, and caregiving, and a general awareness of the health and condition of others. Practical thinkers stimulate their neurochemical processes of other awareness through the daily tasks of caring for other people and the nurturing of children. Each time they do something they know helps another person or child, they experience a cognitive pleasure, which is their truth of other awareness. 
in regard to a neurochemical preference for other awareness by analytical thinkers. This takes the form of the supervising and organizing of groups of practical caregivers to provide larger caregiving and nurturing functions and the running of their corresponding institutions, such as daycare centers, schools, and hospitals. This process and its successful outcome gives these analytical thinkers the cognitive pleasure of truth awareness. And with abstract thinkers who have a neurochemical preference for other awareness, such as medical researchers and doctors, their cognitive experience of truth comes with the successful discovery and implementation of new treatments or procedures that can help many, if not all, members of the human species. Moving on now to the case of the neurochemical processes of dominance. What actually does truth have to do with acts of dominance? Well, dominance is the neurochemical sensation we all get when we control and secure our social and physical environment. And this area of our brain is stimulated on a daily basis through simple dominance actions such as supervising our children and locking our doors. But for practical thinkers with a strong preference for dominance, this cognitive stimulation is achieved through working in such occupations as the military and the police force. These individuals gain a greater stimulation of dominance through the functions these occupations require of them on a daily basis. And in the process, this greater stimulation creates a unique sense of truth for these individuals of the dominance neurochemical processes. In regard to analytical thinkers, with a preference for dominance, these individuals stimulate their brain through the organization and control of the previous group of individuals. So analytical thinkers become the senior military and police officers who organize individual soldiers and police. This gives them a greater sense of control and security and provides them with a unique sensation of the truth of dominance. And in the case of abstract thinkers, with a preference for dominance, these individuals become the military and police strategists who determine the large-scale decisions of strategic dominance. And because the dominant group of any society determines the laws of that society, some abstract dominance thinkers also become lawmakers who write and interpret the laws of the society. These occupations then provide these individuals with their unique sensation of dominance and its associated sensation of truth. And finally, we have the metaphysics neurochemical processes of the human brain. For those members of a population who have this type of cognitive preference and are practical thinkers, they stimulate it through the daily act of worship. And when that worshipping activity accurately stimulates their unique metaphysics neurochemical processes, they experience a sensation of truth. And for individuals with an analytical mind and a strong preference for metaphysics, these individuals stimulate these neurochemical processes through the organization of worshippers into collective groups that usually meet once a week. These priests, ministers, or senior monks gain a cognitive sensation of metaphysical truth through successfully bringing together worshippers in the form of a regular collective metaphysical event. And in regard to the final type of thinker with a metaphysics preference, that of abstract thinkers, these individuals stimulate their metaphysics neurochemical processes through the creation of a particular belief system that reflects the time and place of their birth and the circumstances of their life. And these prophets experience their unique sensation of metaphysical truth through the creation and exposition of their belief system. This now completes the description of the various types of truth that the biology of the human brain is capable of experiencing. Hopefully this new biological perspective on truth has provided greater insight into the nature of what truth actually is. For all individuals, everything comes down to the neurochemical processes of their brain, including their recognition of truth, which can simply be seen to be the cerebral pleasure they experience when particular items of mediation accurately stimulate their unique neurochemical processes.
and these particular items of mediation, are tied to the type of thinking of each individual. And on a personal level, if we look at the life trajectory of any individual, we see that everyone is motivated to move towards an environment or to create an environment composed of specific items of mediation that accurately stimulate all of their specific key neurochemical processes and therefore gives them a complete cognitive sensation of pleasure and hence a complete sensation of truth. And because each individual has a major preference for one neurochemical process over the others, the stimulation of that particular cognitive process becomes the major objective of their life and consequently creates their own personal sensation of truth. For example, in the case of individuals with a strong preference for other awareness, they spend their life moving towards an environment filled with items of mediation that trigger other awareness. And for these people, truth is caregiving. And for individuals with a strong preference for self-awareness, they spend their life moving towards an environment filled with items of mediation that stimulate this particular cognitive process. For these individuals, truth is wealth. For individuals with a strong preference for rationality, truth is science. Individuals with a strong preference for dominance experience truth as power and so on, for the other major neurochemical preferences. Those with a sensory awareness preference experience truth as good art, music, or food. Individuals with a preference for social intelligence find truth in good storytelling. And for those with a metaphysics preference, truth is faith. And all of these different sensations of truth within the brains of individuals across any human population simply have a neurochemical basis. And they're the product of an evolutionary process that has always favored diversity. So in summary, truth has a biological basis. It can be seen to be merely the accurate stimulation of neurochemical processes that have been encoded into the brains of humans through the process of evolution and shaped by the physical and social environment. And it's simply a matter, for each individual, to find the right items of mediation, based on their cognitive preference and type of thinking, to correctly and precisely stimulate their unique neurochemical processes. And if an individual is able to do this, they will feel a sensation of truth, both in the moment and over the course of their life.